Thank you, Melissa. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Brian Gumbus. I'm the executive director of the BA and Esther Greenheck Foundation. Uh, we've been in existence here in uh, Marathon County, Greater Wausau area, since 1998. Uh, and our sole intention is to uh, provide opportunities uh, to this community to make it a better place to live, work, and, and play. Um, over the years, we have uh, involved ourselves in a, any number of community needs, um, housing and homelessness, uh, the food pantries, uh, and the list is, continues to grow, unfortunately. And most recently, uh, our relationship uh, in, in partnering with the uh, AOD uh, partnership um, is relatively new. Um, but this issue is uh, very important uh, that our community steps up uh, as a whole and uh, tries to come up with solutions and ways to uh, help those in, in need. Um, addictions uh, ruin people's lives and I'm speaking to the choir on all of that. I think you are all very much aware of that. Uh, but we want to do our part uh, as, a, as a foundation uh, to strengthen our community any way we can. And so being part of this group and being part of today uh, is one of those little baby steps in trying to get there. Um, and so I hope you take away uh, any number of things uh, through all of the uh, experts that are here today um, talking about their experiences and where they are uh, within the, the addiction world what we can then grasp and pick up and start doing those good things here and making a difference uh, in, in, in that addiction world. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I really am encouraged by the turnout today again. Uh, last year's uh, was also very well attended. A lot of new faces uh, that I quite frankly don't recognize. Uh, so that's a good thing actually. So, um, so thank you again for all coming. Have a, have a great afternoon. Um, this is the second year that we've done this summit, and this is the second year that it's been supported through the BNS to Greenhead Foundation, so we really appreciate their help. Um, on the back of your programs, I believe, or close to the back, has a profile, a little bit more information on all the funders, funding partners uh, from today. So I just want to, you know, if you want to know more about them, I included their websites as well. Um, they do a funding process. Um, they do oh, do grants through the BNS to Greenheck Foundation. So if you want to find out more about them, please uh, check them out. Ron, if I can come up and talk a little bit about the Diocese of Fond du Lac. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. So the Diocese of Fond du Lac, I'm a member of uh, St. John's Episcopal Church, Church right downtown. And we are a, uh, a part of the Diocese of Fond du Lac. Uh, most of the churches in our, in, in our diocese are in the Fox Valley. And so uh, uh, we have uh, some outreach money that's, uh, that's set aside. And, and, and I'm on the, uh, on the deacon's council uh, for the diocese. And they said, you know, we want to maybe get some money uh, over on the western side of the diocese. And I said, oh, great. Uh, and we want to prioritize, uh, among other things, uh, the uh, uh, drug epidemic, the, uh, uh, you know, what's, what's going on uh, uh, that's uh, destroying our, our communities uh, with opioids, etc. And I said, you know what, uh, I'm a member of the AOD partnership. Uh, we had a summit uh, in uh, 2016 that was pretty successful, set some goals. And we're having another one coming up, and I would say that that would be a good place uh, to put some of your money. And and the other thing that uh, that I recommended was uh, a colonia a treatment center in Ramland. They're also in our in, in, you know part of our diocese. And so guess what? Uh, they 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 uh, bought both the recommendations, and I was really proud, you know, that they were able to sponsor. Uh, uh, you know, part of uh, the cost of, uh, of this summit and, and also uh, for uh, the uh, uh, a treatment program at uh, Kononia so somebody could get some help uh, for the cost of, of their treatment. And through St. John's, you know, we're also uh, a congregational member of uh, uh, a group called Naomi, uh, which is part of Wisdom, which is kind of an interfaith uh, justice group. And uh, one of the things that uh, we do is we advocate for, 
for many different uh, priorities, one of which is a criminal justice reform. And uh, we have a kind of a strong uh, a treatment instead of prison uh, emphasis across the state. And one of our funds that, that we advocate for is to increase the state TAD fund, uh, treatment, alternatives, and diversion. And uh, we spent a lot of time uh, trying to promote that. And it's built up over the years to uh, close to uh, over $7 million. And I just heard recently uh, that uh, a Marathon County was a recipient of a TAD fund uh, to initiate uh, their drug treatment court, uh, which will be uh, in operation uh, sometime early next year to kind of complement the very successful OWI court. So I'm very proud of those efforts. And uh, uh, I thank you all very much for coming. Uh, you know, I'm a retired uh, AOD counselor uh, that's uh, been with the partnership for about 20 years. And I've seen a lot of things uh, uh, come and go, and I've never seen so much community support and so much enthusiasm. So although the problem is big and maybe getting bigger, I think we're up to the fight, right? So uh, we can do it together. Thank you. Thank you. Here comes uh, Mrs. Moore running back uh, to uh, man the microphone. Coming back. I said I'm loud enough. I don't feel I need it, but I'll uh, use it. I don't think you do. No. Okay, so <laughs> I love Ron. I do. He was, he was, I think, part of my hiring panel back in 2010, back in the day. Um, so again, just some in-kind contribution recognitions. Um, say rotographics, again, I neglected to include them on here. City Grove for hosting us here again. Um, and then security health plan, uh, with the help of Marshall Clinic, being able to prevent, or prevent, to print our beautiful programs here, which again, we have some extras. Uh, and we already viewed this, but I'm gonna make a plug for it again, and we're gonna show another clip in a little bit. But um, this is a new documentary, for those of you that are, came in just now for the afternoon, a new documentary that was created here in Marathon County with Marathon County kids, with a, a talented Laura Hunt, uh, who's a videographer, and she, we created this documentary series that's going to be posted today um, at healthymarathoncounty.org. Um, and there's different chapters. The total runtime is about 25 minutes. Um, but it's everything from bullying to uh, racial equity to mental health to substance abuse. Um, and we just actually viewed the mental health clip, which, are, again, it's, it's very moving. And again, you know, these kids, this is their reality. So with that, I am going to invite up our behavioral health panel. Uh, I'm going to recognize that we have one, uh, Dr. Caitlin Harris, with the community care management team. Um, she's in Was or excuse me, in Antigo right now. So she's going to speak uh, a little bit later, probably after our 3:30 break. Um, so if I can have Chad and Megan and Lee and Dr. Krell and Chris and Lou, come on up. We have a seat up front here. Why don't we have Chad and Megan start first up here so people can see you, um, and then we'll just kind of have folks come up kind of in order. So I'm going to have them introduce their behavioral health initiatives. The reason we have this as part of the discussion is because we can't talk about substance abuse without, uh, substance abuse without talking about mental health, and there's a lot of great things that are happening parallel to the work that we're doing with the AOD Partnership that helps support kind of where we're going. So um, I'm going to leave that up here and hand this over. Thank you. To you, sir. Thanks, Melissa. Hi, as Melissa stated, my name is Chad Billob. I'm the Chief Deputy at the Sheriff's Office, and I have with me Deputy Megan Sawinski, a deputy with our office. And we're here to tell you a little bit about a new initiative that we're starting effective January 1st. And we're calling that the CART Team, or Crisis Assessment Response Team. Uh, I went to some training about a year and a half ago down in Chicago for something called CIT. I don't know if many people here know what CIT is, the crisis intervention team training has been around since 1988. And quite honestly, I'd heard about CIT. A lot of other NAC acronyms are out there with CIT, but I didn't know what it was about. Went down there and I had my eyes opened. So when we came back, we decided that we we're gonna start a CIT and a CIP initiative here in Marathon County. CIP is Crisis Intervention Partnership. In essence, a CIP uh, training is 16 hours we bring first responders, police officers, firefighters, EMS folks in, and we talk to them about common mental illnesses. We give them some lived experiences or some experiences with mental illness, 
and then uh, talk to them about uh, common or, or issues in the community as well as some resources in the community. Those officers that do well in CIP or enjoy it, we then ask them to come back for CIT, which is a 40 hour long program. And as part of CIT, they take it a step further and they actually go out into the community. They get to see how consumers live. Um, we go to the crisis center and we do some other things. And a big portion of that training is actually where we put them through scenarios. We have actors from UW Marathon County who come in and our, our officers actually say that was almost too real. These actors do just a phenomenal job for us and we throw different scenarios at them that they may or may not have ever seen out in the community. So to date we have about 90 officers right now in Marathon County who have received that training but of those officers we've selected two who we believe exemplify what CIT is all about and we've asked them to be the starting officers are the first ones that are going to take our new CART team out on the road. Um, Megan is one of those officers and the City of Wausau Police Department on Monday selected Officer David Bertram, I believe that's how you say his name, right, to the uh, CART team and they will be paired with a crisis worker every day. So every day of the week, 10 hours a day, there will be a police officer and a crisis worker out on the street together dealing with mental health issues, substance abuse issues, and homeless issues. So if a family were to call and say, hey, I'm really concerned about my son who has schizophrenia and we don't know what to do, these officers are gonna show up and they're gonna be better trained, better equipped, and have better access to resources with that crisis worker in the front seat with them and they're gonna do the best that they can in order to get those people to the services they need before they go and do one of two things. Lock them up in our jail or send them over to North Central Healthcare and lock them up at the crisis center. To give you an example of, and Megan, I'm gonna have you help me out here. Okay. I have 2015 numbers. In 2015, Marathon County did 467 detentions of people on mental health commitments. During that exact same time frame, the city of Madison did 115. So when you think about how we're using resources here in Marathon County compared to a police agency that is more progressive, there's a significant impact. What was that number in 16, Megan? 16, the city of Madison did approximately 84. So in one year, they still dropped it from being over 100 down to underneath 100. And that's, if you think about how big Madison is compared to how big we are. And Madison has five officers doing it, and we're gonna have two. So we think that right now we've got a good ratio, we've got a good mix of officers, crisis workers, and the need in the community, but we're ready to adjust as needed. So right now, um, the team is formed. Um, North Central Healthcare, who's been a phenomenal partner in this, is currently getting ready to post those positions so their staff can sign up, much like ours did, and go through a selection process. Once they select the crisis workers that will be a part of that team, Megan and her partner, and then Dave and his partner will actually come together in order to help write the protocols for how they're gonna actually go and deliver the service in the community. We have ideas, but these are the folks that actually are out there every day seeing it. And I've been riding a desk now for like the last seven years, and I may have lost touch with some of that. So we're gonna ask them to actually be the ones that put a lot of that into practice for us. Um, we expect to be fully operational where they'll actually be on their 10-hour shifts right around April is what we're, we're targeting for. We've addressed many of the needs. Um, the county board has stepped up and given us a position in order to do this. There are a few unmet needs and it's primarily vehicles because we want to have a soft vehicle. And you wonder what's a soft vehicle? Well, it's a police vehicle because um, we're going to be responding all over Marathon County, not just in the metro area, but we don't want a police car that's decked out with a cage and it'll still have restraints in it in the event we need them. But we don't want, we're trying to take a trauma-informed approach to how we actually do these detentions. So we're working with and writing grants right now in order to try to obtain vehicles in order to meet the need of an emergency response vehicle as well as have that vehicle be more trauma-informed um, approach to doing this. When we go live in April, we will be the only countywide program in the nation. The other 
programs that are out there currently are programs that are done at, at the city level. Portland, San Antonio, Milwaukee, here in Wisconsin, it's Milwaukee and Madison and Green Bay that are running a program like this. And we've kind of taken bits and pieces of each and made it what ours is. <coughs> so that's where we're headed. Good afternoon. I'm Ed Kral. I am a psychiatrist and I am the program director for the new psychiatric residency training program affiliated with the Medical College of Wisconsin at the new medical school here in Wausau. Prior to that, I worked at the Marshfield Clinic for 30 years uh, and Security Health Plan and also did some things with the Northwoods Coalition. So I've, I've been in central Wisconsin for a long time. My job is to put together a training program that will take medical students and turn them into good psychiatrists. Our program just started this last July. We have three new residents. We are approved for 12, three per year. And, and I can say that we have three good people who are interested in staying and working in central Wisconsin. This, this program is is part of a broader initiative of the Medical College of Wisconsin, to, which was designed to bring health care resources to central and northern Wisconsin where they're most needed. It includes two medical schools, one here in Wausau and, and one in Green Bay, and two residency programs, the one here and the one in Green Bay. You may not know this, but it's very unusual for a private institution like the Medical College to take on a project like this. And it doesn't happen without a lot of support and partnerships. Part of that support comes from the state of Wisconsin, uh, DHS, with RIPRAP uh, funding. RIPRAP is a grant program which stands for, if I can think of it now, uh, Wisconsin Rural Physician Residency Assistance Program. And there's other grants. So, Representative Snyder, when, you're, when the legislature looks to putting monies in DHS, this is where it's going, and we thank you for it. Keep it coming. <laughs> medical training is a long process. Four years of college, four years, three or four years of medical school. Our medical school is three years to fast track uh, physicians into practice. And then, and then specialty training. For psychiatry, that is four years. We know from experience that physicians tend to stay where they train, they develop roots and relationships and their families settle there. And, and the, the long range goal for this and all this investment is that the, resident, the physicians will stay here and help fill shortages like psychiatry shortages. The partnership, this is truly a partnership of the local resources. Public, North Central Healthcare, and I'm going to give a, a shout out to for Mike Loy, who's the CEO at North Central, and he's been a staunch supporter of ours. We're also partnering with the private sector, with Ascension Ministry Healthcare, and with the VA. So, all of these, this coalition came together to create the need for more psychiatrists in Central Wisconsin. I don't need to tell you that addiction is a team sport. Addiction treatment is a team sport. It, it, it's multidisciplinary, and you need counselors and coaches and all of the team that, that Daniel Shine uh, described earlier in the program. It also needs psychiatrists. Psychiatrists bring things to the table. Oftentimes, people with substance abuse have comorbid issues depression, bipolar, ADD, <clears throat> post traumatic stress disorder. We can help with that, but we can't do it alone. We have to partner with, with you all. And I wanted to thank Melissa for inviting me and inviting us to be in this discussion today. We need, we need you because training good psychiatrists needs good teachers like you. They need training sites like North Central and other places. They need funding. So we need to partner with you in this discussion going forward, and I look forward to having our residents and me working with all of you to address this issue in Marathon County and elsewhere as we go forward. So again, thank you for inviting us to be here today. All right, good afternoon, everybody. 
Uh, my name is Chris Zeman. I am one of those med students that Dr. Kral is uh, talking about. Um, I am in my second year, um, and I'm here to talk to you about the Joseph Project. Um, so you might be able to tell um, that I did not come straight from college to medical school. Um, I spent about 13 years in the Army after getting out of college, uh, and we wanted to move back to this area because we wanted to put down those roots. Uh, and we have family here, and we want to spend our lives and our career here. Um, what a lot of folks don't know is that, um, yes, the Army was difficult, the military was difficult, at times were very difficult, but what was even more difficult for us was making that transition um, from the military life to some sort of sustainable uh, civilian life. Um, so in 2012, we moved back to Rhinelander, Wisconsin, um, and I tried my best to find uh, a job that would support our family, and the best I could find was selling appliances at the Home Depot. Um, and looking back, uh, I'm happy it worked out that way because I never would have made the decision to jump off the deep end and try to go to medical school uh, in my 30s. I never would have made that choice. Um, but we did watch all of our savings disappear. I had a 2011 uh, GMC Yukon that quickly magically turned into a 1994 Toyota Corolla. Um, <laughs> And you can ask my wife um, what kind of person I was uh, in 2012. Um, I was much more short-tempered. Um, I didn't have much patience. It was very difficult. Um, and I always told myself that if I ever had the opportunity, um, I would try to help others that uh, are in a similar circumstance. So. Um, before I started medical school, I worked uh, for a year for Senator Ron Johnson as an outreach representative for him, um, and that's when I got involved in the Joseph Project. How about now? I see, you might need to hold it. Just How about now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so that is when I got involved in the Joseph Project. Um, and the Joseph Project, simply put, is a, a faith-based, job skills-oriented workshop that is designed to take people who may have barriers to employment uh, and help eliminate those uh, and help get them hired. So <clears throat> in um, 2015, um, one of my um, coworkers down in the Milwaukee area uh, found a very interesting um, issue. Um, he talked to um, inner city churches in Milwaukee um, and pastors there who told him that they had so many people that needed to be hired, all they needed was an opportunity to work. And on the flip side of that, he had manufacturers telling him that they could not find enough people to fill their jobs. Um, kind of sounds like a strange problem, right? Um, so that's where the Joseph Project came from. So the Joseph Project is a week-long uh, workshop seminar uh, where we cover things like uh, interview skills, how to budget, um, how to speak and present yourself, uh, teamwork, communication. Um, all this is done in nine hours. So it's a three day, three hour long workshop. Um, and for those folks that, that finish those three days, uh, they are guaranteed an interview with a local manufacturer. Um, so last year when the dean of my medical school uh, challenged us and said, we want you to be the most community integrated students ever. Um, my mind jumped to this. Um, because Milwaukee and Racine and Sheboygan, they have those issues, but so does Wausau. So do all of the other towns and communities in Wisconsin that would benefit from a program like this. Um, so we have run uh, two classes since August. Our next class, our class dates are up there on the, on the screen. Um, so November 21st, November 28th are the next intake sessions. So if you know somebody, send them to us. Uh, give me a call, send me an email, um, and we'll see what we can do to get them into this next class. Um, <coughs> I don't know, that's, that's the most important slide I, I could find about the Joseph Project in Wausau. 
because this is really what the end product is. Those are the individuals that, that we are helping and have been helped by this program. And quite honestly, never would have made it to this point if it wasn't for many of the familiar faces that, that I see in this crowd already. Tammy, I'm looking at you. Okay. So um, if you have any questions uh, regarding the Joseph Project um, or the classes coming up, um, I'm willing to take any and all questions you have. That's all I got for you. Thanks. November 31st, 2016, the state of Wisconsin had 7,138 kids out of home. That was last year. I know that here in Marathon County, I believe we're getting close to 300 that are removed from homes. And if bare minimum, if the kids are suddenly removed from their parents, there's two aces you know, the traumatic experience of being removed and also the crime that might be there, how many more they don't know. One thing is for sure, the quicker that we can get these kids into a stable environment, into the foster system, and also work with the parents to get the treatment they need. But you know, in the same sense, I sit on the administrative review panel here in Marathon County. We overlooked the six month review of the, of the court order so far, of all the cases I've been at, everyone's been drugged that they've been pulled out of the house. I've only had two biological mothers show up. Otherwise, it's just the foster parents, grandparents, and the social worker, that's it. One of the things that we've heard on this is that these kids, uh, the traumatic experience of being maybe moved around to foster homes, there's parents out there that want to adopt. Foster parents, they want to adopt. Sometimes it's two, three, four years before they can get closure and these parents aren't making efforts to try to get re reunified. So we're working on some different things uh, on that case to kind of help get these kids because this is, this is what our message is. It's all about the kids. One of the things I've, I've uh, been on this tour as well, uh, and it's amazing, in Milwaukee we had a young lady come up. She had two of her kids, uh, TPR, which is Termination of Parental Rights, two of her kids. One she gave up voluntarily. She had one little toddler, a little girl. She's 30. She was in a foster care system when she was 10. That's what's happening right now. And so our emphasis in our foster care bills, that'll be coming out uh, in the next few weeks. We'll probably have about 10 bills. And we will, I think, hopefully we'll have about 5 million bucks to play with. Uh, a lot of it is going to be going into the prevention side of things. Uh, a lot of times I know we're looking to refund uh, over the biennium 420 grand for the uh, uh, 211 system here for United Way because they're kind of in the front lines to hear about some of the red flags that are coming up. If a young single mother has a problem with the, with the need a doctor or something like that, it puts a, a, an alert out that we might be able to get some of our uh, preventative groups into the field before these kids and the parents get into the foster care system. But a lot of it has to do with, of course, the drug treatment as well, and, and that will help flag it a little bit more as well. Um, so th that legislation will be coming up. Uh, we also uh, want to start a program here in Marathon County called CASA, which is a court appointed uh, mentors for the children that are out of home. So when they have a court appearance or when they have the hearings in front of the administrator review panel, they're there as well advocating for the child. We do have legislation we want to get more DPI, more involved in this whole system as well. Uh, one thing I've learned down in Madison, and uh, you might remember as well being in the health services, a lot of the agencies don't seem to communicate well, well with each other. And DPI, uh, you know, the teachers and administrators that are seeing these kids every day could have a lot of great insight uh, into the judge and to the review panel on how this kid is doing. And right now, that's not an availability. Uh, they, children and families don't really want an, another party in besides either the biological parents or foster parents, but we are gonna have a bill that will allow educators to uh, write out a statement uh, so the judge can look over to see how they're doing in school and, and give their insights as well. 
This is a, a system we've got to work all together uh, to be able to make it go forward. And it's, it's interesting, I guess, got an email, there is a, a couple of things. Tomorrow we are going to be voting on the um, social hosting, which is a bill Representative Andre Jock has put out uh, and that will put a little bit more teeth into parents or guardians that allow uh, knowingly or unknowingly uh, their teens to be able to drink uh, alcohol underage. So that's coming out. And then I'll get a show of hands to see what you think of this one. We just uh, just had a bill looking for co-sponsorship that wants, if, if the federal dollars for highways don't go away, they want to lower the drinking age to 19. Anyone here think that's a good idea? Raise your hand. Okay, thank you. I, I, I kind of had an idea on that. I, uh, we've, we've got some uh, colleagues that are uh, kind of like libertarians, so uh, I don't know if that will even see the light of day, but we'll see. Anyway, that's kind of some of the efforts I'm doing. Um, the budget was good, uh, and it hopefully will stay consistent like it is right now, and uh, we can continue to focus in on mental health and addiction and uh, whatever we can do, we've got people, uh, industries looking for employees. If we can get them drug free and clean, we can get them out to some really good paying jobs and, uh, and that's the main thing. And to keep these uh, kids in their families and not uh, being pulled out. Our, our social workers are doing a great job. Their caseloads are high and imagine that, you know, they have probably a little PTSD too, some of the things that they see on a day in and day out basis. So. With that, thank you. I, I just want to say that I'm very honored to be your representative uh, in Madison. So thank you very much. Um, so you may have noticed as you guys were seated there and we were finishing up our lunch panel, you may have noticed that I set out one piece of paper on that panel or on that, on your area. And that was intentional because what I'm just going to talk very briefly about is something that I alluded to earlier. And it comes right down to it is that when I had Michelle come here in 2013, maybe even 2012, was the first time we had Michelle here to talk about STEP. We were not in a position to listen. I think we liked the idea. I think we liked the concept. We weren't in a position to actually take action on that. So one of the things that we did this summer through the help of a, a summer intern that we had, her name is Haley, she was fantastic. Um, some of you may have met her. Um, she was able to work with us on a project called uh, the Triethnic Community Readiness Assessment. And essentially what this assessment does is it measures how ready the community is to move forward on things like policy change, things like procedure change, measuring things like what efforts are out there? How much do we know about these efforts? What does the leadership think about this issue? What is the community climate around it? How supportive of people in making any changes? Looking at things like the knowledge of the issue. And then finally, what resources are available? So what you have on your table is just a summary of what the stages of community readiness look like as well as what they actually mean. So what is the definition of vague awareness? What does it actually mean? So when we do this assessment, this would be the third one that I've been a part of. Third one? Yep, third one that I've been a part of. The first one was looking at binge drinking in our young adults, age 18 to 25. The second one was around underage drinking with Western Marathon County Healthy Communities. So this assessment, what we did is we wanted to find out how ready is our community to build a community supportive of recovery. So we handpicked 13, I believe it was, 13 community representatives of different sectors all over the community that are kind of in the know. Maybe not the people in the thick. You know, think about like the mayor or the sheriff or someone in that position, so this chief medical officer to Spirus. Someone that's in a position that knows a lot of what's going on in the community, we wanted to find out from them, where are we on this spectrum that's up here on the right? So I wanna, I wanna just play along with me here a little bit. So on a scale from zero to nine, where do you feel our community is today around being ready to build community supportive of recovery? 
keeping in mind these are the things that we measured. And again, you have, I only, I only put one sheet on each table. It's kind of a play along. But if you're looking at this and if you need the descriptions, they're there. Where do you think we fall? Talk at your table just for a second. Make bets. See how close we get. Place your bets. No. I'm not telling you. Okay. So I'm I'm just gonna ask let's see let's see like the hands and, and I will accept halves or quarters. This isn't a science, but you know, if you think we're between a four and a five, you know, give me the, the forty-five sign or whatever it may be. So where where do we think we're at? Let's just see. What where do we think we're at? Fives, four fives, four fives, threes, threes, threes oh, four fives. You guys are pretty good. I'm impressed. We're sitting at 4.84. Now this isn't science. Well, it is science actually. It's an evidence-based assessment. But <laughs> I, I freely admit, uh, it was Aaron Ruff, my colleague that's out at the registration table, and myself that scored all of these. And you can see, if I was gonna ask you, the last time we did this around binge drinking, which was when I first started in about 20, it would've been 2011, about 2011. You know, just for example, with the issue of binge drinking, we were down here in vague awareness. We barely made it to a three. So that's just binge drinking. Underage drinking, same thing. When it comes to recovery, what I'm proud to say is that our community leadership recognized, you can see here, efforts scored the highest and resources as well. Things like the drug court, which Pat referenced some additional funding, $150,000 came to our community to finally get our drug court off the ground. It's ready to launch, they're ready, they're manning, they're preparing everything, so we're ready to launch in January. A much needed benefit, granted, it's gonna serve a smaller population, but that benefit is gonna be, that population's gonna be ready to move forward in recovery. You can see though, community, climate, and the knowledge of the issue scored the lowest. This is what brought down our overall total. And what it comes down to is our community leadership, which I don't think you guys would disagree, see, the fact that we still have too many people with their heads in the sand. Too many people that don't understand because it hasn't impacted them directly. They can't maybe name somebody that's having, is active in their addiction or in recovery, but they don't think that it's necessarily their issue. I think one of the things we can recognize is that substance abuse does impact us all. It impacts our public health, it impacts our safety. We know that funding or adequate resources is needed for prevention, treatment, enforcement, recovery. There's no one right answer. But you know, the whole idea that we're all impacted and we all play part of the solution, that is what I hope that all of you will take from this today, is that there is a little bit of something for everybody to move this initiative forward. So if it's telling somebody that you attended, if it's telling somebody, hey, you, know, you really should listen to this speaker, that speaker, oh, it's on YouTube, like everything is, good and bad. Um, but you, know, you can see, we're, we're sitting pretty good. If we would have done this, even if we did this two years ago, I have no doubt, I don't think we would have been above vague awareness yet. Our community conversation has changed so much and it's thanks to all of you, it's thanks to a, a number of different community partners and just this attention. So, you know, I just, I just this is kind of part of the setting up the where are we gonna go from here. So with this, I'm gonna shuffle the deck just a little bit because we have some folks that might have to, to scoot out early. And while I have Ashley and Christy come up, they're gonna talk about a new local initiative which we teased at our Spotlight event this year. Who's at our Spotlight? Anybody? Spotlight event in April where we talked about Rise Up. Good couple. So what we did is we actually looked at how do you engage the recovery community into making the community better, making it a better place, investing. So Christy and Ashley, if you can come up, I'm gonna have them start us out with the what it can look like and then we'll move on from there. What I'll ask is if I can have folks wait for questions until the end. Um, we're gonna do what we did this morning is after folks get done talking, we'll have them sit up here and then we'll do all the questions uh, when we get to that point. So I'm gonna stop. Christy and uh, Ashley, feel free to, if you, you can use both mic if you wanna get another mic. 
going, Ashley, if you want to talk as well. Um, just, I just ask that you stay near here. Near here. Okay. Subtle. <laughs> so this it gets yours. picked up. That is. Okay. So, okay. Do you know how to use it? No. Not the microphone. Oh. But I appreciate you holding the microphone to your face. Um, yes, the down. Ashley knows how. how okay. The, what's up? Awesome. Thank you. I'm Christy Keel, um, and we actually brought some helpers. So oh, even though perfect. you said just Christy and Ashley, we brought two of our friends in the action up here. Um, I am a local attorney. I have um, been practicing for 15 years solely in the practice of um, uh, foster care, actually, child. I do guardian and litem work, so I represent children in foster care. And um, I did my first, it was interesting to hear from Representative Pat Snyder because I started my practice in St. Louis, Missouri and actually worked um, within the CASA agency down there and worked one-on-one -on -one, um, with CASAs and volunteers and representing those children. And so that's awesome to hear that those um, services may come to Marathon County because I have a high regard for them um, and, and their success. I, I would say, where, where did I come to rise up and how am I involved in this situation? Um, after moving here in about 2010 um, and getting a caseload and working with families, I found and was most troubled by the fact that about 90%, maybe even more, of my caseload was related to drugs and alcohol and addiction. And more, more disturbing for me was that we weren't reunifying the families. And honestly, in my perspective and um, my practice even prior to that, um, even more so, I'm, I was a social worker before law school, so I have some of that background and focus. I was just, that, that reunification is the first goal. And so if there's any way that we can provide reunification, that's where we're going to go. And I just found um, with either the lack of resources or treatment, and Dan knows, I wish he could open like 300 beds, <laughs> that that need wasn't being met and we were ending in t TPR and adoption and guardianship. So at that point, which is not a bad option if that's where we're at and that's all we can do because permanency for the child is important. But that's kind of how I got involved and talked with Melissa, and I became on the AOD Partnership Board. Um, currently, I'm the vice chair. I think that means next January I'm the chair. And then other um, eight um, boards, such, I'm also on the Department of Social Service Board and other boards such as that. And so here I come to rise up to, to trying to find, um, one of my passions is trying to find alternative ways to get um, those in addiction um, involved in the community um, so that if we don't even have enough treatment beds that we we find all these other ways and everyone in this room is included in that to address the problem there's not one right answer and so that's where um, this speaks to my this what we're going to talk about speaks to my soul because it's really right up my alley so here's Ashley hi I'm Ashley Deering I'm a public health educator um, I'm currently on the Obesity Prevention Initiative um, grant that Marathon County has. I co-facilitate the Healthy Eating and Active Living Coalition, so I'm kind of wondering how is this related to um, recovery, but um, I would agree it is completely related. Um, uh, my program advisor is Sarah Ansel, and she is the one who kind of um, pitched this Rise Up or Porch Light Initiative, which you'll hear more about soon, um, kind of a program that um, is just really amazing. So we are fortunate enough to have this um, grant in Marathon County, and um, I'm just very passionate about thinking about innovative ways of how we impact our community and um, doing community work and just thinking differently and about how we do it with the resources that we have. So, okay. Right. So with that, we'll get started. <laughs> is this a video? There's a couple of videos. like our brief video, um, Sarah, that she spoke about, um, who was the, 
program director at Porchlight out in Philadelphia, which we're going to talk a little bit about. She made that for us. So she's really um, mo motivational for all of us. So rise up. We're, I, I'll, I'm going to say briefly what we are, and then we're going to give a little bit of historical um, background on that. So rise up really is a mural arts program. Um, it's going to be a community-driven participatory art project or initiative that focuses on the process of engagement through workshops and community paint days. And um, so these are our three main takes. So we're going to help to heal, strengthen, and unify the community. Um, rise up as, as you'll get a flyer in, in just a little bit with our goals, our mission, and our vision. We strive to be a positive catalyst for change in the community by improving the physical environment, which would be with murals, creating opportunities for social connection, which will be through community paint days that we'll talk about, promoting community engagement as well, allowing the opportunity for skills to be developed that enhance resilience and recovery. Ultimately, Rise Up promotes health equity. So um, as was kind of briefed on a little bit before, in February, um, Ashley and the HEAL program brought to a SPARK meeting um, Sarah Ansel, who was the director out at Porchlight in Philadelphia, to speak with whoever in the community wanted to come and hear about this non-traditional or, or as folks would say, trauma-informed way of working with the recovery community. So that was in February. So that was the initial time. I was sitting there and I was sitting in the back and I don't think there's one person in that room, well, including myself, that had a dry eye. I mean, it was one where you're just like, okay, sign me up, we gotta do this, Let, let's go. And so then I, actually I remember walking right up to her immediately after and said, are you available April 7th? <laughs> Please come back and speak to a bigger group of people. And so we brought her back for the spotlight event and that was on um, April 7th and she spoke again where everyone is really, um, you know, dry, no dry eyes. Um, after that, we started a steering committee. We really just got whoever wanted to be involved to come, and everyone that came in the, in, in the initial time, like Jeff Campo and others, are going to be involved over a long process. But in terms of those who are, who are invested and able to work on a monthly or even weekly or biweekly basis, there's about nine, of a, nine to ten of us at this point. And so we met really rigorously over April, May, June, even July, or every month since then. And in July, I'll, I'm happy to report that I filed the Articles of Incorporation and we became um, what will be a nonprofit corporation in the state of Wisconsin. So now we have a board and we're in the process of, we have a um, community foundation fund and we're in the process of getting the 501c3 Oh, awful stuff completed. <laughs> but that's where we're at. So we're real. We're legit. We're not just a discussion. We're not just an idea. We're an actual entity that's going to um, begin and, and grow from here. So in October, the, mo uh, the most exciting thing is uh, up through the OPI grant, or the obes there's all these acronyms, Obesity Prevention Initiative, um, grant through the health department, we were, we were able to go to Philadelphia, and there were nine of, us, nine of us that went, and we were trained by Mural Arts of Philadelphia and the Porchlight Project for um, two days. So we went for, it was like a four-day trip. It was not only just amazing and impressive and awe-inspiring to see their program, um, but it was also just really... Um, transformative in building connections among those who are going to be involved in getting the project going. So here we're going to show you a brief video of Porchlight just to give you kind of a taste of, of what their project is like. I can briefly okay. say um, for some background until she gets that going, Mural Arts in Philadelphia was uh, created by Executive Director Jane Golden and I think it was about 37 years ago she said and we were able to meet with her um, when we were out there. She started it working with individuals, um, men that were coming out of incarceration. And it was like a, a way to bring, and it, a connection of them and the graffiti artists in Philadelphia um, as a way to give them an outlet in the community um, to create murals um, that 
could stay up. And that wasn't in, a graf in graffiti, but actually legit, and they were being paid for it. And, and it has grown now to where they've done 4,000 murals. Um, they have about 70 projects going on, and at any year, they have a staff of many, I can't even remember how many, 50? 50, 50, yeah. 50-some 50 staff, and they work on about five, five different programs. So the public art and civic engagement, art education, restorative justice, porch light, which you'll see, and the mural lab. So it is a, I mean, we are just in the very beginning stages, but seeing that you're like, oh my gosh, I have so many ideas, we're gonna go back, we're gonna get this all at once. That won't happen, but they're 30, it'll happen in time. So their 37 years of experience is really remarkable to see. And for us to be mentored by that is pretty cool. That's their, their beginning um, video, and we're going to even show you one that's even more in depth. Um, but, we, and someday we hope to have some, many of our own. So, uh, but it's a great place to get um, an understanding of how impactful a program such as Mural Arts of Philadelphia or Porchlight can be. So here is a picture um, at, that will blow up here of our of the steering team that went to Philadelphia, and you'll see many of the faces actually in this room. Um, and I want and and I it's really important to note the partnership in the steering team and how varied the backgrounds we are, um, which is the very um, illustration of what we want to be within the community: a partnership of many various different um, individuals. And so here, if you start on the right, or le I guess you're supposed to go left to right, we have some artists. So we have Stephanie Coley, who's just an amazing artist in the community, and David Hummer um, over on the far right, who is um, just opened the Wassa Museum of Contemporary Art. And he, he, they both are inspirational. And I, we're so excited to work with them as our first two artists. And it's just um, they're going to do amazing things. And then we have Judy, who's in here from the health department. She was there, as well as Ashley. So there you've got the health department and the, and the um, I guess you'd call it the government sector or <laughs> department, you know, in the area. And then we've got Tara Dreger and Ashley Pop. They both went from Aspirus. Um, and Dan Schein, as you can see, from North Central Healthcare. And then uh, we had Kate Gaines as well, who's part of the Ni Naomi and Wellness Project. I think I collect, hit everything. So we've got, uh, you know, artists, health educators, treatment providers, community engagement specialists, hot, local hospitals. So that's that's where we're going, and that's who's helping to lead the force. Um, but there's so many opportunities just to bring anyone else. In on, in on the action. So um, in the first, in the nine months of meeting, Rise Up has established a mission, vision, and goals. And I think we can hand out our cards here. Um, our first informational cards, I mean, there's gonna be a lot more coming in the future, but this is where we're starting. Um, and 
uh, following, we are following, so the amazing thing is that Porchlight provides a replication manual, so much like you were speaking about Step Industries and Mooring, they, they mentor people across the nation on how to bring this mural arts project to your community. So I mean that is, especially from the legal and forms kind of standpoint, has been very helpful because they've gone through this and they know how to do it, and it um, but also from the process standpoint. Um, and so their three-stage process for Porchlight is engage, create, and generate. And we likewise will be using the three terms. Now may it look different here? Um, it might. And actually going there, it even looked different from the video we're going to show you. We kind of found that you know, each project is different. And some of them might be three months long, some might be nine months, some might be 12 months. On and on. It'll just be the project, um, the people within it. It'll, just, it'll be led kind of as a grassroots roots effort, so it's not one end all be all way. Um, so we can move on, I think. Oh, and that's Jane Golden, by the way, speaking with us, so she's just amazing. <laughs> amazing. So the engage phase, that phase is going to be kind of like where we're getting the initial relationship to build the process between artists, the people that are the participants, the agency staff, if we're working with an agency like um, for instance, Department of Social Service or another agency, community members um, and rise up staff will forge the connections and the understanding. During this phase, it's called kind of, they call them workshops. Um, so again, this can be three months, six months, or whatever it ends up being. And it can include poetry writing, dialogue, painting, community meetings, mural theme discussions, dancing, drum circles, yoga, anything, weaving. I mean, they really say whatever you can bring in to get this, this smaller tight-knit, the participants and those service providers and individuals involved and the artists, um, whatever is going to connect them. And, and the design comes out of that, which is what is up for the mural, comes out of that process. And that is very important to, to there are some amazing murals, and in Philadelphia as well, that are not, don't go through this process and they're just gorgeous. But that is going to be the uniqueness about Rise Up, is that that process is how we're going to help to bring an individual from where they, in the beginning, when they joined this project, to a sense of purpose um, in the end. And so that process is really crucial. So it's not just the mural. I mean, that's the amazing byproduct of it, but it's also the process that gets us there. So after Engage, I think we go to create, and this is where, not yet, no one yet. I was so, ready. I was like, thank you. Oh, there's a video. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, listen. So the create phase, um, after the trust has been established um, between the stakeholders, the artists, um, and the individuals, they begin to develop um, the, the actual vision and the creation of of, I mean, these amazing murals that we saw out there. Um, this language can be achieved in many different ways. Um, it, one of the cool things that we learned about when we were there, which going there was helpful, is, is this thing called parachute paper. And it really helps to get um, it not just being about the artist putting a mural up, you know? So the artist would take, they come in five by five sections, and, they, and the whole mural, say, is like, say it's that big, you know, it's five by five sections, and, he, and they make it almost like paint by number, so that anyone, including myself, who isn't an artist, can actually paint it. And that's where you, at, where you come and have, um, in this create phase, community paint days. So it's the individuals that participate in the workshops coming alongside, so that might be someone who's in recovery, coming alongside a community member that just wants to come and paint, okay? And this is how you work at reducing stigma, uh, um, because you are not only just saying, uh, it, it's what Melissa said earlier, to me this is bringing it, for the topic of recovery and addiction from being about them to us, because it gives a face to the person and the people who are the fa your family and friends within the community. And so that's really where you, you create, and it's just beautiful. And you'll see it in a little bit in a video, but that is, um, that's, again, another place where a lot comes out of it. And then finally, generate. That is um, when we put it up, when the first mural goes up in this final phase, um, and, 
and it just becomes beautiful. And that, um, at the end of that, there's a dedication, and, and you, it's like a party, and you bring out all, and again, that can help with destigmatization, uh, de because you're bringing everyone out and just celebrating what true beauty that became. And this mural, um, I'll do, I can try to get through without crying, but I know every time Sarah talks about it, um, and we actually saw it in person, and so it because they took us on a tour in a in a and we could have I could have gone all day for four thousand murals, but they only let us see about twenty of them or something. <laughs> but this one is called Color of Your Voice, um, and it's all made out of this one was a poet poet poem. So they worked for months um, with this community um, on writing poetry. Um, and there was an individual that came every week and wasn't engaged. And so Sarah, who has spoken with us multiple times, she's the, she was in, there as well as the artist. And they were, um, you know, she would come every week and she would eat because food is going to be important to get um, people to come back over and over again. And she would eat and then she would um, leave and she wouldn't do anything. And it, someone spoke with her about, you know, like, well, what can we do to help? Well, it comes to find out she couldn't write. Um, and she couldn't read, and so uh, those, she couldn't write poetry, and so she said, well then tell me what you're thinking, and I'll write it down. So, so they write her part of her po poem, and then in the end, the artist creates this poem up on the wall that is bringing parts of everyone's poem who are going through recovery and puts them together and creates this thing, and there's like a color-coded system, and everything on the right-hand side is made, is like actually pieces of trash, made into something beautiful. And she stopped coming to the, I don't even know her, but uh, she stopped coming to the um, actual program and the workshops. But then in the community, she heard about the dedication and she came to the dedication and she stood in the back and um, eventually heard that her words were on the wall. And that is like, part of the whole process and now I think I should be done and yeah, she should start video. video. <laughs> my name is Antoine and I'm at it. Hey, I'm coming up on two years clean of drug and alcohol. My name is Bruce. Um, I have 10 months clean. I want to get involved in anything they have to offer here, everything. Thanks Thank for you. being here. The Porch Light Initiative is an innovative collaboration between the city's behavioral health system and the city's mural arts program. And our goal really is to improve the behavioral health status of both individuals and the community at large. Because of the stigma associated with behavioral health conditions, such as mental illness and substance use, people often don't reach out for help. And if we don't change our paradigm, People who need our help are not going to access care. This is not about the counselor saying, okay, well, here's your treatment plan. This is what you're going to do. These are your goals. Now sign here. It's really about what do you need in order to have a fulfilling life? We're interested in your life. Life can be very difficult in some of the communities that we're working in. People have significant economic challenges. They have social challenges. Today's the 26th of January, the 26th day of the year, and there's already been 37 murders, yeah. okay? I grew up in probably the biggest drug market in Philadelphia, so I understand. We have to focus on the things that bring people together as a community. So what can you do to change this? Hey, Roy. What's up? Me. The purpose of the Porch Light Initiative is to use art to enhance mental health resources in parts of the city that are struggling, and to use art to overcome the stigma of mental illness, addiction, and homelessness. And really the beauty of this work, it's really about partnership and collaboration. We're working with the City of Philadelphia, the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services, and then we're working with these wonderful provider agencies, APM, the 11th Street Family Services, Sobriety Through Outpatient, Project Home. They work with the city's most vulnerable population. They were open to embracing non-traditional ways of working, 
and they wanted to deliver mental health services that resonated with people in the deepest way possible. It's about what you bring to this community, and, and we wanted to really talk about what our strengths are and then how that can translate into the mural. The mural is a byproduct. What we're involved in is social transformation and the vehicle we use is art. This program is very rigorous. There are workshops over long periods of time. The artists work carefully and deliberately with participants. We started creating these lists of things that we feel make the community strong. The ingredients for the soup, I guess, that, that is the design. There's a layered feel to this that I like. You guys, I don't know if you're uh, ready for this, but we're, we're painting today. I do this paint. Yeah. It's humongous. And that's just part of his sleeve. Yeah. I'm gonna go with R, R stuff. The process that people go through when they're addressing their own personal recovery, it is a transformative process. And in a similar way, art is a transformative process. Down here, back there. Okay. I'm gonna see this on the wall. Oh, I feel great, because I know I contributed to it. I'll go home and say I had a good day and looking forward to come back tomorrow to finish this. Oh, this is nice. I like this. We just can't wait for people to come into treatment and then discharge them back to communities. We really have to understand how those communities help to support people's health. Mural arts really demystifies mental illness and addiction. And our design, our evaluation design, tries to capture that. What we've come to find is that the people who participate do feel a sense of hopefulness about the future, a reduced sense of stigma. They also report a sense of connectedness to their community that they didn't prior to that. Both the individuals in the clinic and community members create this public narrative around mental illness, recovery, trauma, that is healing. Oh, that's nice. Thank you for being a part of our community. It identifying with something positive. When you see murals like this, it helps people to understand recovery is possible. What we see by providing beauty and hope, people start to see themselves in terms of their potential. The porch light has gave me that opportunity to find me, you know? So I really enjoy it and I'd like to thank y'all. for me on the public health um, side is just the evaluation findings that they have had through um, this program. It's just had really um, great results, not only with the people in the workshops, but then also with people in the community. Um, in the community, um, they did an, an extensive survey. They got, had the opportunity to partner with Yale Medical School that was able to do this um, two-year study and really um, do an in-depth finding, which we're not going to be partnering with Yale Medical School, but we'll be working with um, UW-Madison and also um, locally here with the Medical College of Wisconsin, um, their medical students, to kind of come up with an evaluation study that will work for um, Marathon County and Wausau, or which is our first pilot site. Um, so, so just kind of touching base on some of the findings that they have, I just wanted to highlight that they did have an increase in collective efficacy and in including social cohesion and trust among neighbors, um, as well as an increase in the neighborhood aesthetic and specifically walkability and feeling of safety. And um, also, as they mentioned in the video, that de decrease in the stigma in individuals with mental health or substance abuse challenges. And this is um, a new mural that has yet to be dedicated there. We got to tour it. It was our first mural we saw. And Daniel is going to just talk a little bit about kind of the meaning behind it, which is kind of very powerful. Absolutely. Um, so when I first saw the mural, um, I like immediately like was drawn to it um, just from the, the group that we, we saw a lot that day but there's something about this one that even without knowing what it was like what the background was I was like wow this is like the one I need to I need to learn about so 
Um, one of the cool things that they did um, through uh, the mural arts program, um, which is kind of where I think I fit in and I, I hope to fit in in the future as well with uh, Lakeside Recovery, is they actually partnered with a substance abuse treatment program and they provided um, classes um, to those individuals um, by artists so that they could meet with some of the people that were in recovery and they can, that are actually in the treatment programs and learn about their stories. So essentially what they did for this project here is they met with uh, several individuals who um, collectively shared their story about addiction. And um, what was really cool is they also shared, um, I don't know if you guys remember this, but I was like, oh, that's what we do. That's what we do. So there's a, there's a few things that they're doing in here. So um, uh, the, the gentleman on the left um, is meeting with his mother and he's sharing um, his list of amends. So he's making amends. Um, one of the one of the steps we know is to um, be able to reach out to those people and um, you know apologize for the mistakes that we've made in the past. So he's meeting with uh, his mother to do that. Um, right here, there's actually the, the masks um, which which are laying on the ground, which is also another substance abuse treatment um, uh, topic that you do, where you um, you learn about the different masks of addiction and the things that you wear um, when you're trying to hide the addiction. Um, and then you also see some of these um, paper airplanes that are being thrown, which actually start from the tops of the people that are still in the towers or that are still in the active addiction and being able to, to reach out and throw um, all the things that they um, they wish that they could change about their, their lives. So in, in a few of these, it says, you know, I'm sorry for the things that I did, Mom, or it's, you know, things like that, which are really, really horrible. So when I, at first, like I said, when I saw it, um, oh, and then, uh, sorry, there's a, a group of individuals down here um, from a support network that are holding a parachute uh, um, capturing device where you know somebody could you know leap off of uh, that tower and be and be um, brought into the support network uh, which is pretty cool too so um, so when I like I said when I first saw this I was like oh man something's drawing me to it but then the more I looked at it you know this this really tells a story about recovery um, which I think really translates to not only you know Philadelphia the treatment partners that they have there but also to people that are in recovery all throughout um, in the world too so um, that's a little bit about that <coughs> Yeah, so a just quick show. This is just us kind of admiring the mural. Um, and then if you um, can't really tell by the pictures, but it also incorporates stained glass. So it's just kind of a nice um, touch to the mural. Um, this is also another one of the murals that was um, created with the patients of the people in um, the Kirkbride, which is the behavioral health um, center there. And um, what's really cool about this mural is um, it has QR codes of having like that music piece and kind of um, the people created this and so you can kind of go on the mural and listen to the music that they created and it's also people that are in the, um, that are participating in the workshops, those are their faces and they're kind of telling their story through the windows. Um, but just kind of the, the study findings for year two, which is that sustained um, relative increase in collective efficacy moderate but sustained relative increase in perceptions of the neighborhood aesthetics and quality and then just that promise and sustained um, just in the stigma reduction. This is um, the Rise and Shine mural which is called um, the North Philadelphia Beacon Project. It's also kind of our inspiration for our name. <laughs> this mural um, was really kind of spoke to me of the community engagement side. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with a, an individual that was sitting outside of the healthcare facility, which is, this is painted on, and they were so excited to tell the story of what Porch Light stands for and how it's important in their community. So it's just another reinforcing reason of um, doing this here and getting the community members to tell the story of recovery, even if they have not experienced it for themselves. Um, this is also one of our, or both of our artists, um, just kind of learning that, that parachute cloth, cloth um, tactic and sticking the, the, onto the wall. It's true. Okay. <laughs> so we um, are, where are we going from here and where will you see Rise Up? Um, you know, we are planning to start two workshops like tomorrow. No, <laughs> as soon as we can. <laughs> So we have two pilot programs that'll be going on, and I'm just going to give them um, the microphone briefly. I guess we're running short on time, but they can speak about those. Sure. Um, so, um, do we, do we, yeah. Okay. Sure. So the, the first one that um, we're hoping to integrate. So one of the one of the things that we did on the last day of our tour that we had 
other than run the rocky steps, which we did, by the way, which is an extremely yeah. team building experience for community partners in case you're um, So other than that, we actually got to see uh, the Kirkbride Center, which is the first inpatient psychiatric hospital ever uh, built in the United States. So um, we actually got to tour and meet with um, some of the um, some of the, the lead clinical people from, from that facility. They have about 230 beds, so when I look at like my six beds of treatment and then I look at theirs, it was kind of, um, I felt short. So, um, so when I looked at that, they were talking a lot about how they were bringing in um, different uh, substance abuse um, programming through porch light into their treatment. So what they would actually do is they would take these artists and they would bring them in and introduce them to the people that were in treatment, learn their stories, um, and then actually have the artists be able to depict those stories through art um, in, the, in a collaboration process with those people that were in recovery. So um, one of the first projects that we're hoping to create, and uh, mind you, we're still kind of in the initial stages of it, but we're hoping to partner uh, David Hummer and uh, Stephanie Coley with some individuals, uh, well, all individuals from Lakeside Recovery so that we can have um, art workshops for them and learn their stories that we can hopefully depict um, as one of the projects um, about their stories of recovery in our community. Because what we know about our community is very different than Philadelphia. So I think the, the art will translate to that, and it will be very, very unique. And I also think it's going to be a great experience for the people involved, too. So thank you. My name is Tara, and I work at the Health um, Community Health Program at Inspire Hospital. Um, so we're very proud to be part of this, this project um, and also one of the pilot sites. Um, ours is going to look a little different. We're going to work with our medical home team, um, and they provide services for our patients and employees that are on our health insurance plan um, that are identified by having different needs, um, specific needs that they, um, they identify. Um, the medical home team helps to improve their health and navigate resources, whether that be in the hospital setting or in the community. Um, so our workshop is going to look a little different, but we're really excited to kind of try something different. Um, the great part about Rise Up is that it does expand to be on recovery. Um, so even though um, that's one of our focuses, there's many more focuses that we can kind of branch out into. So um, I'll just say that we'll put these out on the resource table. Um, it has our website information as well as our email information. So if you're interested in more information or learning or getting involved, we'd love to speak with you. So, um, so thank you. And you're on Facebook. Oh, Did you we're, mention we're on, on Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. We have Facebook. Because that's how I found them, yeah, on Facebook. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Facebook, we have Get Involved, um, website, Facebook, community paint days. Um, be, uh, we're looking, you know, in the future, we could translate into like domestic, working with populations of domestic violence, veterans, youth, the Hmong community. We look, we are different in that we would like to branch into all health priorities, although, I and others have a very strong interest in the recovery community and hope that there will always be one of those projects going on um, with the recovery community. But we look, we look for anything. And donate. You can always donate, too, on the website yeah. through the community fund. Um, and Sorry. we'll, that's right. We're done. Aside. I'm like, i got to move aside. I, I said, it. I'm pulling the hook. There we go. Um, so those are going to be out on the resource table along with other things that we've talked about here today, other presenters, other information. With that, I'm going to bring up Michelle. We are going to be flexing around our, our order and our, our schedule this afternoon. So if you are interested, there are delicious sweets and salties and sodies and all of that. Um, go ahead and, and if you need to, go ahead and get yourself uh, taken care of. And Michelle, if I can have you uh, up next, since okay. you're right next to me, I've got this up and ready to go. In 2013, I had the opportunity to write a planning grant um, when I graduated from the Social Innovation Leadership Experience through Marquette University. And what I did it around was sober living. So I spent about a year studying different models uh, throughout the United States on sober living to try and find the best practices. Then I had to come back and tell the community on why it was important. We didn't have any sober living in the Fox Valley when I started to do this, and people honestly weren't very interested in it. So it was kind of an uphill battle. Um, so our vision was to have a safe, supported place for people to live when they could get funding to continue with treatment. 
we were seeing too many people going to unsafe places to live, and we wanted to find a solution for that. But we also knew that our community is very based on self-sustaining models. So as much as we could, we needed to figure out a way for uh, us to pay for a majority of our programming by our own services. So uh, we looked at, and this is the National Association of Recovery Residences, and we looked at their um, levels one through three. We knew we weren't going to do level four, which is um, a higher level and, and more certified staff. And so we knew we weren't going to do that model. Um, but we looked at, do we want to do level one, two, or three? And when I say we, we partnered with NOVA Counseling in Oshkosh and Morning Program in Appleton. So it was a very strange collaboration, two treatment centers and an employment center. You would think that the two treatment centers would be um, competition for each other, but they viewed having sober living as a joint effort as a bigger solution to help more people. So they were really able to put their um, competition hat to the side and look for the, gooder, the bigger um, solution for the end game. So we started out looking at the Oxford model in Madison, and then um, St. Paul looked at two different um, nonprofit models there, and then Prescott, Arizona, which was a whirlwind of sober living, that we looked at all different types of models, ones that were focused on education, ones that were for profit, and then only one nonprofit. Out of about 200 sober living houses out in uh, Prescott, there was only one that was nonprofit, a nonprofit model. All the other ones were for profit. And if you've kept an eye on what's going on out in Prescott and Florida, um, there's been a lot of legal issues with insurance fraud, and we saw some of that when we were out there. Um, things that were happening, tests that were being given that weren't necessary, and you could. When we were talking to them, you could just get a feel that it wasn't right, that this wasn't the direction we wanted to go. Um, so it was a good and bad tour um, of sober living because we learned what we didn't want to do, but we also learned what we did want to do. There are some really great models out there that are still operating. And then we also um, looked at a model in Milwaukee, which has now shifted and actually we um, got the treatment component in with it also. So then we had to look at, at the whole market as a whole. Was there a need in our area? Did the Fox Valley actually need sober living? And it came up, yes, we did. Because we were sending people to Prescott, Arizona, to Florida, to other places, and we were losing all this talent. And people who are in recovery become really good assets. And we were losing that whole space to these other areas because people were there <laughs> getting sober and staying sober. And I might need you to hold it. And then just as you're turning your pocket, just so okay. you can kind of fade out. Okay. So we wanted to keep people in our area. And then we needed to look at was there enough places that could refer to our sober living? And then what were the trends? And so just analyzing the whole system, not just is it a good idea to open up sober living because we think it's a good idea? We really had to take a look at, was there a base for this? We decided there was, and we used a business model canvas to do that. And this is a really good visual um, way to do a business plan. And it helps you see who are your referrals gonna be? Where is your revenue stream? What's your competition? Um, why are you doing it? If there's not a good reason as to why you're doing it, you probably shouldn't be doing it. So if there's not a good value proposition, then you might need to go back to the drawing board. So we got through this process, and this is where we started our pilot from. And so this was done with one person from Step, Mooring, and Nova sitting in a room with a consultant and going through and saying, okay, what are we gonna do for our pilot? So we decided we were going to start out a small men's apartment and just give all of our rules and such a try. We learned a lot in a short amount of time. 
Um, but we decided it was a need and we wanted to move forward. So we opened up a women's house because there was less opportunity for women in our area. So even though we did the pilot with men, we decided we wanted to start with women. And we opened up Ohana and um, we did the phase one treatment or uh, sober living. So it's people coming directly out of treatment or who are working at step and have 30 days clean. Those were the only people we were accepting. And we did the model based on many of the models we saw in uh, Prescott and in uh, St. Paul. So there's a live-in house manager because we wanted that accountability. We didn't want residents running and deciding um, the rules and we wanted accountability. We wanted structure. We wanted them to know that we could come into the house at any time, do room inspection. We're really strict. We have three strikes and you're out. And one of the strikes could be after you've been warned a couple of times that you didn't make your bed, and then you get written up for not making your bed. That can be a strike. So we're pretty strict. And we use making your bed as an example of your recovery. How's your recovery going? If you're not getting up in the morning and you're not making your bed, how's the rest of your day going to go? What else is going on in your recovery and in your life? What do we need to be talking about? So we opened up Ohana, and after a year of it going very well, we opened up Mahalo, which is a men's house. Same exact structure. And then we had waiting lists, and the Community Foundation in Oshkosh came to us and said, would you open up a third house? And that's how we got Mana, which is a graduate house for men who have either gone through transitional housing at a residential treatment or have graduated from Mahalo. So we decided, because people keep coming to us and saying, can we learn more about your model, that we were going to license our sober living model. So over the past couple of months, we have spent a lot of time doing this, putting all the paperwork together, and we have a sober living license that people can purchase, and you can have all the paperwork and everything you need to start a sober living house. And this is all of the paperwork. There's multiple pages. <laughs> There's a lot of paperwork that goes along with it. And we've um, improved our paperwork. We've improved our, our rules and our processes. We've listened to the people and changed things to help them, um, changed things based on what we've learned from working with them. Outcomes. We've had 76 people in our sober living program since we opened in October. 82% leave clean and sober. Think about that. These are people who are coming in 30 days clean, and 82% of them are in our program clean and sober. 20% have relapsed. We do follow them for a year to 18 months after they leave, which can be hard sometimes. Um, and we've had about 20% relapse, but the majority have gotten back into recovery. Um, we've had somebody actually come back into our sober living house for the second time. 20% um, are enrolling in higher education. 70% are increasing wages or getting jobs that are over $10 an hour or promoted after leaving the program. We feel like our program uh, is tested and has proved itself to, to be one of the best that we've heard about. Um, we're addressing issues um, quickly because we have a staff member whose job it is is to run that, that program. And then each house has a, has a house manager as well. So there's a lot of oversight. 
um, which we think is one of the keys to operating a good solar building. Any questions? I didn't. There's um, different menu options that you can get based on how much help you would want. So if you want more information, you can email me, Michelle at stepindustries.com. And it's in your program. And it's in the program. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so how do you, do you have a waiting list now? And if so, like, how do you, um, do you manage it? Do you plan to expand more traditional uh, living? Our waiting list go like this. Yeah. So it kind of depends. You know, one day you can have two people on the waiting list, and then one day you have no people on the waiting list. So it all depends. Um, I don't want to expand this program right now. I think the number we have is good for this period of time. I think at some point I would love to have an apartment complex and maybe have twos of people. Um, living in it as a graduation and a more independent living would kind of be my next thing. Okay, we're going to hold out on more questions for just a bit. I'm going to invite up the folks from Wisconsin Voices for Recovery. Go first. Thank you, Michelle. I'm going to repeat again. I, I seem to have somebody's program. It had notes in it. I won't tell you what drawing. No. <laughs> I'm not for sure what it is, but we'll just leave it right there. All right, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Melissa, and uh, to the Recovery Summit uh, for inviting us to join you today. My name is Caroline Miller, and I'm the director of Wisconsin Voices for Recovery, and this is my colleague. Hello. Hi, I'm Jessica Gashi. I'm the program coordinator for Wisconsin Voices for Recovery. So first we're just going to introduce ourselves, talk a little bit about how we got involved in Wisconsin Voices for Recovery and our interests, and then go into a little bit more detail about the projects that we're currently doing. Um, as you see from our slides, Wisconsin Voices for Recovery is a partnership between uh, Wisconsin Voices and the Division of Continuing Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, uh, also with the, the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. So we have had a grant uh, from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services since 2013. And so, as I mentioned, I'm the director of Wisconsin Voices for Recovery, and I always like to share when I'm giving presentations at, at things like this, and really anywhere in the community, that I'm a person in recovery. And for me today, that means that I can be a daughter, I can be a wife, uh, I can be a citizen, I can pay taxes, uh, I can talk to you today, uh, I can be a good friend. Um, my life has been totally transformed by recovery, and it's just an amazing, beautiful thing. And you all are here today to really learn about how we can help increase people's experiences having recovery, living in recovery, um, and, and helping to encourage people to transform their lives. So kudos to you all for being invested in this issue as well. Um, another major reason why I got involved in this work, I was in recovery uh, for a couple years and really started seeing you know, the gaps in um, services, things like housing, uh, things like collegiate recovery programs and communities, things that I did not have access to when I was trying to stay sober uh, in my uh, kind of late teens and early 20s. It was very challenging, very isolating. Um, I managed with peer support, and that's, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, uh, to maintain my sobriety, but I was really moved to be a part of building something here in Wisconsin. And um, another main you know, kind of point in time for me that really pushed me into this trajectory of being passionate about recovery and wanting to share that and really build it up in the state of Wisconsin uh, is in 2013, I mentored a young woman. She was a student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison studying criminal justice. She was getting prepared to go uh, overseas for a semester to study. And she had been in recovery, um, and she had a setback, so she went back out um, just one time. And you know, you all may have worked with individuals who've experienced that tragically, um, but she lost her life to an opioid overdose. And when she died, you know, going to that funeral was a really surreal experience for me. And again, many of you have probably experienced this. Um, but I just remember thinking, you know, I want to spend my life 
work to solve <laughs> in some way. You know, I know I can't be solved, um, but I wanted to spend my life to help. Uh, so women like the woman that I worked with, Alex. So another mother did not have to, to go through that experience. Another father did not have to go through that experience. Um, so want to share that, and you know, we all have those stories, and I encourage you all to share, you know, with each other about that today. You know, often not through the rest of the afternoon. Why are we here? Um, and sometimes we need to be reminded of that too, so we can stay motivated and keep doing this work. Um, so now we'll hear a little bit more about why Jessica's here. Thank you. Uh, that is Megan as well, our, our fabulous intern with Wisconsin Voice. Was just running around, testing some stuff out. So it's longer to acknowledge her. Um, so why I got into this work? I actually just came on board with Wisconsin Voices in June. Um, prior to that, I have been a therapist. Um, I'm a therapist here in Wisconsin. I was doing it for 13 years at a privately owned clinic in the West Bend area. Um, so I got into the work because of my brother. Uh, my brother has struggled with an addiction for 20 years. For the past 10 years, he's been struggling with the addiction of heroin. Today marks 98 days of sobriety for him. Yay. Yay. But, uh, So my family and I have gone through his addiction with him. Um, I say that I am recovering because I'm recovering from his addiction. Um, I've done a lot um, within the movement to make sure and ensure that no other family has to go through what our family has gone through. Um, I found my brother overdosed twice, most recently 98 days ago in my home. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about you know, peer to peer support and recovery services and getting coaches into EV setting. And this is why I joined uh, this movement and wanted to do this because I am a firm believer in peer to peer support. Um, I have been trying to offer my brother therapy uh, for the past 10 years because I'm a therapist and he never took it. Um, and finally, being able to finally get after this last overdose, getting him hooked up with a recovery coach was the one thing that pushed him to go up to Koinonia, where he went, I don't know where that is from here, but I think it's up here somewhere. Um, so he went to Koinonia and he was able to um, go to treatment there for 90 days and uh, make a turn that I've never seen before in my life. And um, he graduated from there and now is at STEP and he's been there since. And I just cannot, actually he's been there, he's been there since. He's was 20 days, 30 days. Never mind, 30 days. And he's been a step since then. And this is something that my brother has never ever done in his entire life. So, um, and I know that it's because of that peer-to-peer -peer connection that he made with somebody else that was in recovery. Um, I'd like to take the credit, but it was not me. So um, it was my brother being able to connect with somebody, you know, else in recovery that got him to where he's at. And so he's at Step Industries now, um, in their sober living, and he's working there and um, that's what got me in this field. I'm also the president of a nonprofit organization here in Wisconsin called Stop Heroin Now. And so we help fund people for treatment. And yeah, I'm just a huge motivator, I guess, and believer in, in this process and getting people help. Um, we can stop or I'll start crying. Okay, go on. <laughs> we like, you know, and we like to keep it real and we wanted to share personally, you know, about ourselves because we need to, you know, we need to keep it real in this field. And uh, really share with each other again, our motivations and how we can, um, you know, work together to address this issue. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we do, um, and really we have a couple main goals, you know, and we're about keeping it simple, right? Although these are not simple goals, um, but first and foremost, we're about building community, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we do that. But how we can, as Michelle stated, you know, people in recovery are assets. Family members who are in recovery are really assets to the state of Wisconsin. And how can we build community, bring people together, bring resources together, share what's working in the state, uh, and really build this network? So we're exploring different ways to do that. We have a statewide advisory council of around 15 members right now. People in recovery, family members in recovery, professionals, um, other folks who are invested in recovery and this issue. Um, so we meet monthly to really talk about, okay, what's working? You know, we hear a lot about what's not working. And I don't know about you all, but it's, it gets heavy. <laughs> it gets tiring, you know. We want to talk about what's working. Um, and so we really focus on, okay, is something happening in Ashland? We have our advisory council member talking about that. So maybe someone in 
you know, Dodge County is picking up on that idea. Or what's going on with, you know, Step Industries and this housing. I mean, this is amazing. How can we get this resource across the state? So we're really trying to come up with new and innovative ways to connect the dots um, and really increase support statewide. Um, and then we focus on eliminating stigma because we know that stigma really prevents people from accessing the treatment and services that they need. Uh, if you're feeling stigmatized because you have an addiction, I remember when I first went through inpatient treatment um, as, as an adolescent. When I came back to the high school that I left to go to treatment, I remember walking down those hallways and people calling, calling me names. You know, loser, druggy. And I was you know, horrified. I did not feel supported. Um, that is not what I needed to help maintain my recovery, which at that time I was really committed to. Um, so I know personally what that feels like. And we have tons of stories with family members as well. How can we get rid of that and build up a culture of support in the state? Uh, so we do that by two main ways. The research shows there are two main ways to help affect and reduce stigma. That is to increase the public's personal contact with someone in recovery or someone who may be struggling with addiction. So perhaps Jessica and I talking today might reduce someone's conception of what someone in recovery looks like, what a family member in recovery looks like. Uh, we also hold statewide events as well. Step Industries and Darjun, um, and many of you here today have been at our statewide rallies that we host every September uh, at the steps of the state capitol. It's amazing. We have policymakers, we have people in recovery, um, organizations from across the state, all coming together around recovery, around the main issue, um, our common issue. And then lastly, you know, we just aim to make a difference. And sometimes, you know, that's in small ways. I know Jessica, you know, I'm so grateful to be working with you. Um, but I learned Jessica's pretty much on call for the state of Wisconsin. Um, and there's actually a lot of people like this in the recovery community, Mandy, you know, and others, who literally have given out their personal cell phones. They have Facebook messages constantly, text messages, calls from parents, people seeking treatment from all over the state of Wisconsin. And this is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, these people are out there across the state as we speak, you know, responding. Um, but this is really, again, an example of the community solution to a lot of the issues that we're facing. So how do we build up uh, these assets, you know, this community solution? Here's our lovely state. You know, we're very blessed, we're very fortunate to live in Wisconsin. Uh, it is a beautiful place. I drove up from Madison today, and it's, I love this area. I mean, the trees, and it feels, still feels like fall, right? Snow hasn't come down yet. Um, we're so fortunate to live here, and as I mentioned, we have advisory council members in each region of the state. Uh, so we have really a strong statewide uh, representation. So now Jessica is going to talk a little bit more about our ED2 recovery project, which is very exciting. Okay, I'm sorry. I made over a very bad cold from last week. Okay, so um, why we're here. So we currently are in ED um, setting. We have seven organizations that have um, been granted money. Um, from our organization, and they are going into 11 hospital settings currently, and we are, so counties, 11 hospitals and county, um, throughout nine counties. We don't have that picture. No, we do not. Okay, so we are um, going in and allowing recovery coaches to meet individuals inside the ED setting and provide them that peer-to-peer -peer, um, contact as soon as they arrive on scene from an overdose setting. We feel that we uh, feel that this would be a very good benefit for individuals who are um, first coming in. It's our experience, uh, research also has, has shown that when people come into the ED setting, they don't want to talk to a physician. They don't want to talk to a nurse. You guys are shaking your head, you know this, right? Um, even their family members sometimes, they don't want to talk to them. So um, a person with no experience, however, they'll talk to somebody in that setting. So we pair them up with somebody, they follow them and track them then um, with their initial setting inside the ED, and then thereafter, weekly, um, every day for the first week, and going forward, we can track them for the next year, if need be. Um, so this grant is allowing us to go to the ED settings and provide that peer-to-peer -peer, um, support. And we do measurement tools as well. So we have evaluations, um, measurement tools that we're housing inside the University of Madison. 
to be able to provide effectiveness to make sure that our program is working. And uh, hopefully it's going to show that we do have outcome studies that are good and responsive and that we can continue to grow this throughout Wisconsin and uh, not just in this, the um, nine areas that we have currently. You know, the one, one piece, just so you're aware, um, the grant that we receive is from the Wisconsin Department of Health Services as a part of the state targeted response to the opioid crisis. So you might have seen some things in the news recently. Um, the state of Wisconsin has been awarded another year of that funding through SAMHSA, uh, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So it's very exciting. Um, we you know, feel very fortunate to be able to be stewards of these resources. Um, and so we're continually looking at ways that we can help to get more uh, more resources out to the organizations that need them in the state. <coughs> so lastly, uh, really, you know, what we're talking about here with ED2 Recovery is this solution of peer support. And as Jessica mentioned, you know, people want to talk to someone who's had that experience. You know, if you're not a person in recovery and you're here today, say, you know, something's going on, you know, at home or you're struggling with just fill in the blank, right? What will help you get through that issue? Calling a friend, you know, picking up your cell phone, texting someone, messaging them, uh, meeting someone for coffee. You know, it's not it's not rocket science here. This is nothing new. Um, what we're talking about though is, you know, peer support and ensuring that this peer support is formalized and structured and organized in a way that people in recovery can access it. So we're hoping that ED2 recovery will uh, really be a part of the solution in the state of Wisconsin. And um, lastly, I just, I love this picture. Uh, the word hope, you know, recovery is about hope, and peer support is really about showing people that there is hope, that recovery is possible. A person in recovery could show up in the ED setting when that person is there having had experience an overdose, and just show up. Not say anything, just their physical presence could be a sign of hope for that individual. Uh, so we're encouraging you all to think about today. I think there's a brainstorming session coming up later, or go back to your organization and, and think about how you can bring your support to this community, to Marathon County. What does that look like? Is it through more formal programs? Is it you know talking to your faith community or other organizations you're a part of? How can we bring more peer support to impact people being able to maintain, you know, get into recovery and maintain their recovery? So if you'd like to contact us, um, sorry, we've been a little goofy at the office. Um, if you'd like to contact us, use our contact information. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, we want to know what's going on in your community, too, and we want to support you all out here. So if there's a group that might be interested in doing uh, recovery coaching in the ED setting, contact us. Um, but we'd be helpful more than happy to help assist in, in developing any types of recovery supports in this area. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> it seems like friend Caroline and I've had the pleasure of being friends with them for a while, and Jessica especially, we worked very close together the last few years trying to fight this epidemic. Um, and that's the best picture I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about RCOs, uh, Recovery Community Organizations and Centers. Basically, they are communities and organizations that are placed in the heart of your county. And so we talked a little bit earlier about recovery coaching and what does that look like? Um, and now we're going to talk a little bit about, so where do those recovery coaches go? So those recovery coaches are best fit in a recovery community organization to help house by the organization. It helps give them somewhere that they can call home, outside of their own homes. It gives them community. It gives them a sense of security. And it's basically, recovery community centers are like little beacons of hope. And I'm fortunate enough that when I started Dar June, which is a recovery community center in Green Bay, Wisconsin, you know, they go with this old model at CCAR. When you build something, they will come. That, that's not always the case. So a lot of work has to go into it because we were the first official recovery community center in the state of Wisconsin to develop, and nobody knew what the heck it was. A lot of people said, well, we've Alamo Clubs. 
and we have clubhouses, and they have A and NA. And so we had to educate Wisconsin and let them know, guess what, those are recovery community centers. They're recovery community organizations. So Darjeet took it a little bit further with the help of my counterpart in crime from back then, Jesse Heffernan, and we found faces and voices of recovery. So what Darjeet did is we went ahead and we applied to be a recovery community organization. And then myself and Jesse went out and started educating. And what does that look like? How can we turn into a recovery community center? So today, what we do is we help initiate and sustain recovery. We went from a safe place for people to gather with a pool table and some hamburgers and french fries to a full-fledged drop-in center. So those people that can't seek help, we help fill the gaps for the whole state. We have people that drive from Milwaukee, we have people that drive from Madison. Um, there are a few more recovery community centers now. We have um, Oshkosh has a community center, Solutions. So they're able to go there now. But before all of that came to fruition, we have people coming from all over. How can we get help? What do we do? So we slowly had to change. Um, that's how recovery coaching, honestly, became a part of our gym. We had a coffee jar that sat up on our counter, and we had no services other than Alan. an Avenal Club sort of feel with your anonymous meetings. And everything that was put in this coffee jar kept saying, peer support, peer support. We need peer help. We need people that get it. I can't get treatment. Doors keep getting shut in my face. What do I do? So Jesse and I talked about it. He went to CPAR to get the train the trainer. And then I shortly followed him to get the train the trainer. The minute we put in recovery coaching, we I couldn't even believe the visits we would get to our center. I used to look at CCAR a mile and go, wow, like they have like 4,000 volunteer hours in like a year, like how is that even possible? How do you even get people to volunteer? I used to be a huge big book thumper and huge in AA, and I had trouble getting my sponsees to make coffee, all right? So I thought, how in the world? Well, it worked. We started training recovery coaches, and I have never seen so much dedication in my life. The miracles they create, and the hours they put in. And so that's what a community center does. It gives all of the resources out here that can't get people help right now a drop-in center to do it right away. And it's like I said earlier, like you get those phone calls, and you can go to bed at night when you have a community center in your community. So right now, we were our measures were up to an hour to get somebody a recovery coach last year. We are now at 15 minutes to get somebody face to face with a recovery coach at their Zoom from the minute of somebody walking in our doors. So in Green Bay alone, out of those 72 coaches, we have 23 coaches that are pretty much on call to us whenever they can be, and they rush to our Zoom if there's not somebody already there. We also have a telephone call out service and a text line at our Zoom. So how that works is. CCAR likes to say, you know, it's that phone call I never received that changed my life. And so that's what we do. All of our recoveries go on a list. And so we employ people that can't get jobs anywhere else, like Step Industries, but we do it in the cafe industry and the restaurant industry and give them jobs elsewhere. Because we're the two easiest jobs you can get when you're a fellow. In a factory or in a restaurant. So I'd like to thank for some of the restaurant portion of Step Industries. So when they are bored, and we may not have anybody in there for them to serve french fries and hamburgers to, um, what they do is they do a call out to our recoveries that may have missed an appointment or haven't been in in a month or graduated our program, and they just need a little extra help. So they'll call out, they'll check on them, and then they'll get them hooked right back up with the recovery coach. We like to call it our shadowing program. So what they're really doing is they're shadowing 20 to 30 hours before we put them in recovery coach training, in which they have to be nine months sober for to enter. So once they've done that, we kind of inform them, guess what, you just fulfilled your shadowing hours. And they never even knew they were doing it. But we wanted to see if they were going to give back. We wanted to see that level of recovery, because that's kind of where when we vet our recovery coach training, we can tell who's ready for a training and who's not. Because if they're willingly giving back, then they've already hit that mark that I like to call gratitude. And that means they've already found something of a purpose to give them that gratitude. 
And so that's what makes excellent pleasure coaches. And it all starts with a community center and sometimes a little coffee can that just sits there with suggestions. So what we are trying to do right now is bring Darjun to Wausau. Um, the fortunate part about Darjun is I am from Wausau. Um, our accountants and our attorneys, Ruderware, are housed here. And they are the people that built our nonprofit for us that just finally got out of pending six months ago. Last year, we couldn't do anything with the conversation because we were still pending. Now we are no longer pending, and we can take in the funding we need for it. So, in just a second, because I can't be in Wausau all the time, could our new Darjun Advisory Committee of Recovery Coaches stand up so everyone in here knows who to talk to? You guys all kind of know who you are. Awesome. These are all volunteers willing to help this county, and they're going to be pretty awesome recovery coaches, too. So if you'd like, Jane and Tammy will be heading it up, and you can get with anybody on the advisory committee for Darjun. Um, and we're going to start the process starting next week of getting those numbers and lists out for all of our healthcare providers, inspire us, all the hospitals. So you guys have a list so you can call these recovery coaches. And starting next week, they'll be working on getting us a location and some funding. So, thanks a lot. We'd love to talk to you. Um, there's more coffee. I ordered some more coffee, so I hope that everybody drinks at least one cup and takes one to go. Um, there's still some sweet treats over there. Please continue taking the sweet treats. But yes, by all means, continue to drink some coffee. So we are going to have our final uh, afternoon piece now with the lovely Lynn, uh, talking about emotional CPR, eCPR, which is one of these things that we wanted to, I wanted this to be part of this because one of the things that all these different conferences have been at, that we always talk about these programs and initiatives, how do we help others, but we never talk about how do we help ourselves, right? So that's, you're here to talk about how do we help ourselves. So if you'd like to please, like I said, grab some chip, grab some coffee, grab some chips, and all that, and win. Go get your phone Thank you. So just an introduction, I'm Lynn McLaughlin. I'm the Vocational Learning Coordinator at Step Industries. I do a lot of different trainings, including I just finished completing the Seat Car Recovery Coach Trainer, um, which is going to be fun. I'm going to be doing some trainings with Mandy. Uh, I'm also a certified peer specialist trainer and um, person-centered planning for peers trainer and then I'm also an eCPR trainer. And eCPR is by far one of my favorite. I like them all for different reasons, but emotional CPR, when you think about it, um, I think applies to everyone because we're all human beings and we all have emotion. So I'm starting with, I don't know how many of you know this picture. This man is named Kevin Hines. At 19 years old, he jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And he is one of 1% of the people that survived the jump. He has an incredible story. You talk about tragic and inspiring. He's got videos on YouTube if you have a chance to watch them, they are incredibly inspiring. I'm sharing this story with you because Kevin tells his story, and I've had the opportunity to meet him, and he's one of the most authentic people you will ever meet. He talks about how when he made the decision to jump off the bridge, he walked to the bus station, and on his walk to the bus station, he said, in his mind, if I connect with anybody, I won't jump. And he got on the bus, and he was sobbing uncontrollably in the back of the bus. And there were a number of stops where people came in, and they left, and they came in, and they left. And no one acknowledged his sadness. No one said, can I offer you help? Is everything OK? He got off the bus, and no connection on the bus. And as he's walking to the bridge, a woman comes up to him. And she says, would you please take my picture? And he took the picture. She walked away. He walked to the bridge, and he jumped. And it's been a long recovery back. But right now, you know, when you talk about 
the hardships we have in life and how they create your story. Right now, he is, his story is just incredible, and he talks about his challenges with mental health and with substance use, and how that connection was all he was looking for. And that brings me to Johan Hari has, a, YouTube is fabulous, like there's all kinds of stuff out there that's really cool. Um, but he has a video about addiction. And one of the quotes that comes out of that talk on YouTube is, so the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's human connection. And that's what ECPR is all about. It gets back to the real basics of connecting with one another and helping one another through emotional crisis. So what is ECPR? ECPR is a community education program that helps members in the community or teaches members in the community how to assist another person that's going through emotional crisis. What's interesting is who doesn't know someone or themselves who's gone through emotional crisis. I think it's a very human, um, it's a very human experience, obviously. You know, anytime you have a life-altering event, albeit, you know, a death of someone you know or even positive things, it's life-altering. You find out you're pregnant and your life changes in different ways. Um, so an emotional crisis is a state of extreme emotional distress. And if you think about times you have been in emotional distress, it's really confusing. And you're trying to find your way. And for me personally, I can't think straight. And I have people around me that I can talk to that can help me get back to my center, get back to what makes the most sense to me, and then move forward. So that's what an emotional crisis is. I'm gonna go back for a second here. Why ECPR? ECPR came about, and actually I'm gonna get into that in a moment, but when your physical heart is in cardiac arrest, we do CPR. ECPR is for your emotional heart, an emotional crisis, and working through that um, by applying the skills of ECPR. So it's the other CPR for your emotional heart versus your physical heart. The foundations of ECPR. ECPR was created by a group of leaders in the mental health industry. They, um, one of the primary leaders is Dr. Dan Fisher, and he is the president of the National Empowerment Center of Massachusetts. He is a person who has been professionally trained as a psychiatrist but he also has lived experience. And he started looking at the contrast between take a medication and I need somebody to connect with. And he, along with a bunch of other leaders in the industry, created this model called ECPR. It is a trauma-informed approach, and I'm gonna go through it a little bit more about what that means and how it works. Yes. <laughs> it, um, meets all of the 10 components of SAMHSA's definition of recovery, crisis counseling for disasters. In fact, as a trainer, I was contacted about a month and a half ago, is that right? Um, to potentially go to Puerto Rico and help the people, train people as trainers and train people in ECPR to help them with the emotional piece. You know, the, the homes have been gone and the electricity doesn't work and there's no water, but who's tending to the emotional piece of the devastation of losing everything? You know, so it, it helps a lot in that area as well. It also instills hope and is a suicide prevention practice, has cultural empathy in that one of the most beautiful pieces of ECPR is, although it can be applied in a recovery setting, it's more in a human setting, so it's human to human. Um, and in the peer support model that the component of mutuality, where you're meeting with another person at eye level, like Carolyn was talking about, the peer model of meeting someone who's on the same, the same wavelength as you. That's not the word I wanted, but I can't think of the right word. It's three o'clock and I'm tired. No. Um, and I'm sure everyone is. Um, 
but that it's not the clinician and the client. It's not the teacher and the student. It's two human beings trying to help one another make it through to the other side. Um, so those are the foundations. There's three phases to eCPR. The first phase is in the connection phase. You're connecting with another human being through compassion, concern, and opening lines of communication. If you think about a time in your life where you were describing to someone, possibly someone you didn't know that well, something you were going through, and something in their face, or something in their body, or something in their voice, you knew that you were being heard, you were being seen, and you were being understood. That's what happens in the connection component of UCPR. It's that moment where your body just relaxes. You know, the shoulders drop, the voice drops, and suddenly you're just two people talking to one another. So it helps bring the crisis down. The second phase is empower, which we took the P instead of an E, just because CPR kind of works that way. Um, so power is used to reconnect them with their purpose, their passion, and their power. I like to tell the story. Um, I am also a person in long-term recovery, and I have the mental health dimension from depression and substance use. And gosh, it has to be the early 2000s, I was talking with a friend about a difficult decision I needed to make around a relationship that I was in that was a long-term relationship. And I remember looking at this person and saying, what am I supposed to do? Are you gonna tell me what I should do? Because I, I felt I was in the crisis and confusion and all that. She looked at me and all she said to me was trust yourself. That was all she said. And at that moment I was like, I don't know what that means. But afterwards, I understood, especially as I healed through that process, the importance of inner wisdom, the importance of recognizing that every person has the potential to make really, really good choices if we believe in them. And that includes people in recovery, that includes people with mental health. You know, if we see all people as whole and complete, and know that they can make the best choices they can. So the empowerment piece is bringing the person back to that awareness and helping them move forward. The last phase is revitalization. That's helping them reconnect to their routines, to their roles, their relationships, their responsibilities, helping them get back to who they are. Who am I when the crisis is removed? Who am I? That was another thing. Carolyn, I'm a daughter. I'm a mother. I'm an employee, you know, all of those different things, all of those roles, it's getting back to that. Um, so that's the third phase. God, I feel like I'm like speed dating because I'm talking real fast. <laughs> okay, um, so this is the, the trauma piece. When you talk about trauma, I think I do, I also do a training in trauma informed care or practices and approaches. Trauma is very personal, it's very subjective. Um, in my certified peer specialist training, which actually I did last night, I was explaining the example. If someone comes up to you and they are very emotionally distressed and they say, oh my God, I broke a nail. And you're like, well, that's not a big deal. But if you don't know their backstory, what if they had been abused and their nails were pulled off? I mean, that's pretty extreme, right? And looking at your faces and you're like, <gasps> but it's something, you know, we don't think about that. We don't think about, everybody has a story, and that's true of people in addiction, that's true of people in recovery. Like I said, it's true of everyone, so engaging that um, compassion and empathy. So when you're going through a traumatic event, no matter what it is, a life-altering event, some of the impacts of trauma, initially you feel alienated, you feel isolated, very much by yourself. You lose your voice. I know from trauma that I worked through from childhood, I lost my voice at a very young age. And 
It was probably 40 years old, which, you know, is only like not that long ago. Um, <laughs> uh, that I regained it and was able to start speaking for my, you can laugh, she knows my respect. Um, but you, you lose your voice, you get very numb, disassociated, um, and confused, all of those things. So the power comes back by regaining your voice, by putting voice to your story, by putting voice to your trauma, and that's something that's learned through ECPR. Um, and then the emotional state is through revitalization. And again, that's the remembering who you are, what your roles are, what your relationships are, and who you are essentially at your core. So that's like the fastest. <laughs> Did that very, very quickly. In conclusion, a Maya Angelou quote, the area where we are the greatest is the area in which we inspire, encourage, and connect with another human being. If you would like more information on ECPR, um, you can look up, actually, it's emotional CPR on the web, there's a web page. There's also the National Empowerment Center, or you can contact me directly, I'd be happy to share more information.
Come back up to the front when we come back. So take your time, minute, stretch.